All right, friends, thank you very much for joining us this morning for the uh, program. Our uh, team of Aggie horticulturists have put together a series uh, that we know have been very engaging for us and we hope are engaging for our audience. Uh, it's a series called Gardening on the Gulf Coast. We have different programs that we're bringing to you weekly. The first one for this month, of course, is Home Citrus Growing with Horticulture with Ag and Natural Resources Agent for Aransas County, Ginger Easton Smith. Before we begin this program, I'll ask for those of you just joining us, if you can please mute your microphone and also turn off your video camera as a courtesy to the presenter. The program uh, may last up to 45 minutes. We will have ample time for questions and answers. If you do have a question for Ginger, please uh, use the chat function of your uh, of your viewing screen to be able and we will uh, answer those questions as we get to them. If you have a question about how to get to that uh, function, simply use your cursor, roll it over the middle of your screen. A bar will pop up and within that bar there will be uh, an, uh, a way for you to engage your chat function. It looks like a little word balloon. Just click onto that. You can ask any questions just you like in that chat function. After the program, we will be uh, contacting you uh, with a brief survey. We'd like to know how we're doing uh, with the job that we're providing, with the materials and the topics that we're providing, and how meaningful they are to you. So thank you again for joining us for the program Gardening in the Gulf Coast. Today again, home citrus growing with Ginger Easton Smith from Aransas County. Ginger, take it away. Thanks, Stephen. Good morning, everyone. I um, also wanted to mention that a link um, of this presentation will be emailed to you. Uh, and go back to this slide about the upcoming programs. Um, you can see there, but next week, Boone Holiday, who's a horticulture agent in Fort Bend County, will be talking about young tree care. So we hope you'll sign up for that and the others. These are the topics that I'm going to cover. Uh, growing requirements, planting, water, fertilizer, and issues. Um, of course, it's a lot to condense into a less than one hour program, so it'll be, I won't be going in depth, but there is a lot of information online about citrus, or you can always contact uh, me or the extension agent in your county. So the growing requirements for citrus, it is a sopical, whoops, subtropical to topical tree. So it likes uh, temperatures of 70 to 90 degrees best as, uh, as I do. Um, it will tolerate high, higher temperatures if it has plenty of water. And then on the, the low temperature side, trees are generally damaged when the temperature gets down to about 24 degrees which I hope you don't see very often, and fruit generally is damaged below 26 degrees. So the Gulf Coast is generally a good area for citrus growing. Um, I'd say the disadvantage we have is our high humidity. In drier areas, there's going to be a reduced risk of at least fungal diseases and maybe some insects. The site selection is very important. Uh, full sun is required by citrus to produce well. And when we say full sun, it means at least eight hours of sunlight. Good drainage is also really critical. A, plant, a citrus plant will die if it doesn't have good drainage and the roots are sitting in water. We also wanna test the soil for pH and nutrients so we can um, fine tune amendments we're adding like fertilizer, maybe some organic amendments. And then the space is important um, for a regular citrus tree that is not on a dwarfing rootstock. You need about 18 to 30 feet um, for it to grow really well. And uh, if you're growing it near a fence or a, or a house or some other structure, even a driveway, you need to be eight to 10 feet from that structure for the plant to do really well. You can go a little closer, maybe you have to do a little more pruning or might be a little crowded, but these are the ideal spacings.
It's also important to think about which side of your house you're going to locate your citrus tree, um, especially in areas that maybe have uh, lower temperatures in the winter. The south side of the house is usually going to be the warmest spot in winter or is going to be the warmest spot in winter because of the way the sun moves. And then the second warmest spot is going to be the west side of the house. Part of this is the sun and then also part of it, uh, part of the reason for putting it on the south side is it pro is protected somewhat from northern winds. If you place it eight to 10 feet from a house or driveway or something, you will also benefit from some reflected heat off of that structure and also some heat that is released, uh, stored heat that's released as the temperature cools. So if freezing is a big concern for you, then you wanna put it on the south or west side of your house. Um, of course, there are things to do during cold, such as water thoroughly and then cover it, but um, that's a topic for another day. Okay, drainage is one of the most critical things. Um, if you've got standing water when you dig your hole, do not plant there, or, you'll, or at least you're going to have to make some um, amendments to plant there. And it'd be a good idea to do a drainage test. Even our, in our sandy soil here in Aransas County, sometimes we have poor drainage. So dig your hole, fill it up with water and see how long it takes to drain. If it takes more than hour to two hours, then uh, you'll have to make some adjustments. If the roots are sitting in water, they're not gonna have any oxygen and, and the plant's gonna die. Okay, if you do have drainage problems, one of the things you could do would be to use a raised bed, build a raised bed, which can be built out of uh, pretty much anything that will contain the soil. You can, even, you can even just make a mound without walls, but it's nice to have the um, cinder blocks or wood or something to contain it. If your issue is that you have clay soil, then you're gonna have to add in some amendments, but you wanna use a lot of your native soil mixed with those amendments because the roots are gonna to have to go down into the, into the native soil at some point. Um, 12 to 18 inches high is sufficient and it should be at least eight by eight feet. Okay, I also mentioned doing a soil test and uh, Extension loves to recommend soil tests. We say you should do one every year, but if you did one before planting and then maybe every three to five years, that would be great. You really want to find out what your pH is and what the level of some of your nutrients are. So you can contact your extension office to find out uh, what the procedure is, to get a form and also to get a, a test bag, sample bag or you could also go online um, and get this information. You can search soil testing or it may be on your county extensions website. So you, you take the sample, uh, you send it into our lab at College Station and then you'll get a recommendation along with a list or a graph showing what your levels are of all these uh, nutrients. And the recommendation that's going to be made is going to be the, the ideal for the plant growth. So maybe you can afford to put those amendments in. Maybe you can only afford to do some of them. But I would um, definitely put some phosphorus in in the bottom of the hole if that's recommended because phosphorus takes forever to move down from the soil surface. So at planting is a particularly good time to add phosphorus if it's needed. <clears throat> Excuse me, some of our soils are already high in phosphorus and so we don't want to add more. So that is one of the very important reasons to test your soil. It takes about two weeks to get your results. We do not recommend adding a lot of organic or other amendments um, 
when you plant a tree because you can't amend the entire area where it's going to grow. It's fine in a in a flower bed or a vegetable bed, which is generally smaller, and you can amend the entire uh, soil area. But you really can't for a tree. It's going to have to it's going to have to get used to growing in the conditions that are there. So that's why we don't uh, don't recommend that any longer. You can add some mulch or compost on the surface after you've planted, and that will work its way down. Here in our sandy soil, it will disappear fairly quickly. Just keep putting more on in as large an area under the tree as you can, and it will improve the soil over time. Okay, varieties are really important. Uh, whether you wanna plant an orange, grapefruit, lime, lemon, maybe a pomelo. And then there's different varieties of each of those, but that's a whole nother presentation. And Steven Brugerhoff, who just introduced me, is going to do a presentation as part of this series on that on September 30th. So that'll be great timing um, just before planting season. Okay, you only wanna plant that citrus tree or any other tree you're gonna plant one time. So it's really important to start with good planting material. You wanna look at the fruit tree, at the citrus tree, check out the shape, um, make sure that it has a strong form with a central leader, which is basically um, the trunk there. You can see just goes straight up all the way to the top, basically a straight line. That's the central leader. And then around that are the scaffold branches that should be distributed around the tree um, and up and down on the branch, on the trunk, sorry, up and down on the trunk. Okay, the scion is the desired cultivar you want that is grafted onto the rootstock. And the bud union, you can usually see it's a different color of bark generally, and it should be about two to three inches above the soil. Sorry, yes, two to three inches above the root stock. So it'll be two to three inches above the soil when you plant it. Of course, you want something that has uh, nice green leaves, that looks healthy, no signs of disease or insects, and a trunk that is not damaged. Nice bark, um, no places where it's been mechanically damaged or something has chewed on it. Generally, we plant uh, grafted trees for citrus and most other fruit trees. And that's for a few reasons. One is that they don't necessarily come true from seed. So you could take, uh, pick a fruit off that tree right there, um, pull out the seed and plant it. And you might get the same kind of uh, tangerine, but you also might get something that is a result of of cross-pollination. That tree might have crossed with a lemon when it was pollinated. And then you are not going to get the same kind of fruit that's on that tree. Sometimes with seedling grown trees, you don't even get good production or don't get production for many years. We also graft for disease resistance, uh, primarily Phytophthora fruit rot and Tristasia virus. And then grafting is also done to dwarf a plant. Recently, um, A&M has developed some varieties that are called frost, and they are not grafted. They're primarily uh, directed at areas where the plant might freeze to the ground. For a regular grafted tree, if it freezes to the ground and then starts to regrow, it's very likely that, that what is growing is actually the rootstock, which is not going to have good fruit. So um, these trees were developed so that if the tree froze to the ground, regrows, it's still going to be the same variety. So these, I think there's three of the frost varieties now. Um, people frequently ask me if their orange, for example, is sour because there's a lemon tree nearby and it's cross-pollinated. Um, and I think this is a <clears throat> commonly held idea. I mean, it it kind of makes sense that 
maybe it was cross pollinated and then the fruit that's developing is a cross between the true between the two but it's actually the next generation where that will show up so if if a flower on an orange tree is pollinated by pollen from a lemon tree then a fruit will develop but it's going to be that orange variety but if you take that seed and plant it that is when you will see the results of the cross pollination so it's fine to plant uh, your sweet fruit next to your lemons and limes it is not going to affect it Okay, so moving on to planting. I have a dog like this that digs holes, but unfortunately she doesn't dig them where I want them. But anyway, you need to clear away the grass and weeds in about a two to three foot diameter around the hole. Is there a question? Oh, maybe I need to remind everyone to mute your mic. Ginger, we have Hover a over the center of your screen and you'll see the little icons and you can mute your mic. Right. We have a question about lichen. We have a, a lady that's got a, a palm tree and a citrus that are growing really close to each other. She says the citrus is not being shaded out by the palm tree, but the leaves on the citrus generally don't look that great. And um, she wants to know, is there a watering issue with the palm tree pulling up the moisture from uh, the citrus? And then she wants to know what, what can be done. Stephen and I have both recommended that, that she get a soil test done to, to see what her nutrient levels are. And, and then I went ahead and recommended that maybe she should use some chelated iron and good citrus food. Yes, that, that sounds like a good plan. and. Uh palm trees also like iron. Um, I think a, sit, a, a soil test would be excellent. And until you get your results, I would water those trees thoroughly, maybe once a week or every two weeks, water them really thoroughly, the whole root zone, and add some, some fertilizer that has, at least has nitrogen in it. If you already have some fertilizer at home, you can use any fertilizer is probably going to help. Um, and then again, you might want to take some pictures and send them to your your extension agent or send them to me. And then uh, I advised her that the lichen are growing there probably because of their high rainfall. Oh, lichen growing on the citrus. Yeah. Yeah, lichen like citrus um, and lichen don't hurt the plant at all. Um, they're not killing the tree. They are just growing there because they have an opportunity to grow there because uh, maybe, as you said, the leaves don't look as good. Maybe there's not as many leaves as there should be. So there's more sunlight getting to the trunk. And so the lichen uh, have an opportunity to grow there, but they are not hurting your tree. What are your thoughts on applying a horticultural? early on uh, is that is that suitable for citrus as well horticultural oil for the for uh, on the in, leaves in our area because of the um because of the drier summer months a lot of times i see uh, spider mites and i see some other pests on the citrus is an early treatment of horticultural oil something that's good for that yes that would be good don't spray it in the heat of the day, spray it uh, near the end of the day because we're already into hot weather. Yeah, I generally cut it off uh, by the end of May and don't recommend it after that, so. That sounds good. You could spray uh, some kind of insecticidal soap um, at this time of year. Okay, we have a couple of more questions. We have a question, um, birds are pecking their oranges uh what do you recommend for to try to keep the birds from damaging fruit that's a hard one um there are bird nets you can buy to put over fruit trees it's one possibility uh, another would be to hang old cds or strips of uh what is that stuff? It starts with an M that balloons are made out of now. Mylar. 
strip some mylar in the tree or there's other things to try to scare the birds away. And other than that, um, it would be bagging the fruit with something, either a paper bag or some sort of a mesh bag. All right. Go ahead. If they're just doing a surface, if they're just pecking the surface of this of this rind, it doesn't really hurt the the fruit inside. It, it's they're hard to control. Yes, they are. Can you have a question? Um, Peggy has a two year old car car orange tree, and she says it produces lots of flowers each year, but uh, that she's not getting fruit because most of the fruit is either dropping off or being eaten by trees. She wants to know, is that normal on a two-year-old tree? It's either it's dropping either. off or, or what? Or being eaten by critters. Oh. Um, yes, two years old is, is still very young for a fruit tree to be producing. Um, but next year, I would say to, to water a lot, um, between March and May especially, water heavily. Uh, when I say water a lot, I always mean water heavily, but not frequently. So maybe once a week, give your tree a really good soaking and fertilize, do a soil test and fertilize. But yes, at this point, it's normal to have a lot of fruit drop. I was just going to point out, Ginger, that uh, my citrus that are in containers, I have to water about every two to three days and mm -hmm. I back off a little bit. Yes, that's a good point. In containers, you have to water much more frequently. I think we're caught up with questions if you'd like to go on. Okay, great. So you want uh, you want to clear that grass and weeds away because they will compete with a, with a young tree. So keep them cleared away. Uh, dig the hole to the proper depth, and I'll talk more about this, but it depends somewhat on your soil type. Uh, always dig it about twice as I'm uh, sorry always dig it as deep as the soil in the pot is and then if it's uh if it's not sandy soil if it's not loose you probably need to dig it dig it twice as wide as the pot is to loosen up the soil the best time to plant trees is in the fall but you can also plant citrus in the early spring <clears throat> in the heat of summer is not the time to plant a citrus. You want to cut away any broken or decayed roots, uh, clean cut with clean pruners, and you want it to be at the same depth as it was in the container. This is really, really important, especially if it's planted too deep and the moist soil is up on the trunk, on the bark, it's going to rot that bark, and it's also going to promote, uh, it's going to make conditions right for, for rots like Phytophthora. So never plant a tree too deep, meaning deeper than it was originally in the pot. <clears throat> if it's planted too shallow and a lot of the roots are up above uh, ground level, they're going to dry out too quickly. It's okay if the top of the root ball, root ball is about an inch above the soil when you plant, because it's probably going to sink down some, um, even though before you put the plant in, you're going to firm the bottom of the hole to try to prevent that. And before you put the plant in, in the hole, it's a good idea to um, shake it off a little bit gently and, and wash it to get some of the soil off, because again, it needs to be in the, in the native soil. So you want to water it in thoroughly. You want to tamp down the soil. Um, and when you water, you might even want to water when it's halfway full, when you've, when you've put back half the soil that you're going to put in. And then you're going to make a berm, a little, uh, a little mound of soil in a circle around the tree several feet out. You don't want that close to the trunk because you want the water that's to concentrate the water, to hold it a little more. You don't want the roots developing right next to the trunk. You want the roots to move out uh, so that it has a larger, stronger, more drought resistant root system. Um, if you plant the, the tree too deep, 
you can it can result in what's happening on the picture on the left here you can see that this is planted like a uh, at least an inch too deep and this and the bark that had been under the soil is rotting away so that is also going to kill a tree just like um, sitting in too much water will kill a tree <clears throat> excuse me so again make sure it's no deeper than it was in the pot Okay, after you have filled, backfilled the hole, tamped it down, gave it, given it a thorough watering, you want to add a layer of mulch. A couple inches deep is great. It could be ideally organic material like wood chips or bark or ground up leaves or whatever you have or can get. You can purchase that in bags or in bulk. Maybe you can get it from your transfer station. Avoid rocks because uh, they're gonna hold too much heat. And keep that mulch at least nine inches away from the trunk. Uh, for the same reason that you don't want soil against the trunk, you don't want mulch against the trunk. <coughs> Excuse me again. And then you're gonna need to replace it as it decomposes or as it sinks down into the sand. And this is a great way to improve the soil right around the tree. It adds nutrients, it increases the water holding capacity, it increases the uh, beneficial microbes in the soil. It's just a great thing for a healthy plant. <clears throat> As I said, you want it about two to three inches. Um, in addition to those benefits I already mentioned, it helps it helps control the weeds to some extent, um, holds in the soil of moisture, and it keeps the roots cooler. It moderates the soil temperature. Um, and I think I might have mentioned, but keep it nine inches from the trunk. This is one of my, uh, my main soapbox issues. Don't plant trees too deep and don't put the mulch against the trunk. On the picture on the left, I see this Everywhere I go, I see mulch piled up against a trunk. We we have a name for it, volcano, volcano mulching. Uh, it might take years for the tree to decline, but that tree is going to decline because of that, because that mulch stays wet longer. And also because it's organic, as it decomposes, it's releasing heat and it's going to rot that trunk. And then the, then the tree can't move water up into the top of the tree because the connection is broken because the, uh, the tissue that would move the, the water up is rotted. <clears throat> Picture on the right, it's a little hard to tell. Uh, there's no depth perception really, but this is um, mulch properly. It could be a little bit further from the trunk, but it is a flat layer out from the trunk and it goes out into a large circle. And then you can see they've got their irrigation spitter out their ways. That's great. So this is a sort of cutaway view of, of what you want, to, you want to do when you've planted a tree. You want the bottom of the root ball and firm tamped down soil. You've uh, cut the roots that were decayed or that were circling around the pot. You backfilled it slowly, <clears throat> get all the air pockets out and really wet that soil. The top of the root ball is level with the ground and the mulch is several inches away from the trunk. And then you can see that soil berm, which is also, uh, which is probably about two, one at two to three feet out from the trunk. And Texas Forest Service, which is also uh, one of our sister agencies, they have some great graphics on their website. You just Google Texas Forest Service. Ginger, okay. we have two questions. When you talk. Yes. Take a break. Okay. Um, we have a question about rats. Um, someone wants to know how, what your suggestions are for dealing with uh, rats falling into their trees and eating their fruit. Oh, yes, rats love to, and other rodents love to chew on citrus fruit. Uh, 
you can put out baits or traps, uh, get cats or dogs, or you can uh, make sure that, well, you can make sure there's no uh, way for the, you can prune a tree so that no branches are close enough to other trees where the rat could jump from those branches onto the citrus tree. Um, if it's near a roof, I mean, the rat probably can jump from a, from a building onto the citrus tree. There's nothing you can do about that. But you could also put um, metal on the trunk, like a, a ring of sheet metal that you can wrap around the trunk. Then when the tr uh, rat tries to climb up the trunk, it's too slippery. So it has to be several inches thick, maybe about five inches thick, five inches wide, I mean, just a thin sheet of metal that you put a ring around the trunk. Uh, unfortunately, those are the only recommendations I have. I don't know if some of the, uh, some of our horticulturalists if you've got other ideas, maybe you can put them in the chat. Another challenge of fruit growing. Okay. Um, okay. You have a question about what are your suggestions when you have a bountiful harvest of citrus? It was particularly a question about um, lemon, but when you have any type of citrus that you have a bountiful harvest, what are some of the uh, better ways to preserve that? Uh, I just want to know. How can you uh, keep that for later use? Okay, well, one, one thing is to harvest it as late as possible. The best way to store it is on the tree up to a certain point. So you might want to pick a fruit, cut it open, make sure that it's still good, that it hasn't gotten uh, sort of mealy and dried out. Um, once they're harvested, of course, refrigerate them and they should keep four weeks at least. Uh, beyond that, it would just be juicing, I would say juicing them and freezing the juice for later use. You might share them with the food bank. They do take produce now. Those are my ideas. All right, we, we got to get you going or we're going to run out of time. Stephen and I'll do our best to answer questions. Okay. okay. Okay, so you might have a irrigation system with uh, emitters. You need several per tree. And when the tree is just planted, you want to put the emitters close to the trunk and facing outward. You are not trying to water the trunk. You're trying to water the root zone. Watering the trunk uh, keeps it moist and can lead to diseases getting in. And as the tree gets gets more and more mature, then you want to move your irrigation, whether it's emitters, whether it's an irrigation system or your hand watering, you want that water farther and farther out because you want the root system to expand. If the soil is dry, the roots are not going to move into that area. So in the beginning, you want to at least water as far as the drip line. Um, Overwatering can be a problem. And again, overwatering is watering too frequently. Um, it's not giving it too much water. You really can't give it too much water as far as the tree is concerned. You can, you can water so much that it moves beyond the root zone and you're, you're wasting water. Um, so we do want to conserve water, but that's probably not going to happen. Um, but don't water too frequently. So when you've just planted a tree, every one to three days for sandy soil and every uh, every three days initially for um, clay soil. And then you can increase that interval by one day every few weeks. And if you're not sure if it needs watered, stick your finger in the soil. If it's still moist an inch down, then you don't need to water. But if it's dry an inch down, you need to water. And then for established trees, maybe every seven to 10 days during the summer. So in general, we say that, that citrus needs 50 inches of rain or water a year, which of course even uh, evens out to about an inch a week, but uh, it doesn't want it evenly distributed throughout the year. 
There's times of the year where it needs more water and times where it needs less. So you can see on this chart, June to August is the highest need. And of course, that's because the, uh, the temperature is the hottest and the fruit is developing. So it needs about an inch and a half per week, every week from June to August. And consistent watering is very important for good fruit quality. Then September to November, it's not as hot, an inch a week. Uh, should be plenty. December to February, the tree is not doing a lot of growing. It's probably not producing a lot of fruit. Uh, maybe maybe limes and lemons are, but it's not hot. So one to two inches a month is sufficient during the winter. And then March to May, we go back to needing an inch a week. Of course, if we get rainfall, we don't need to water. And the timing is critical. Um, the March to May thing is because um, the tree really needs uh, fruit. Sorry, the tree really needs water. Um, it needs to be well watered before it produces its flowers, which are going to develop into fruit. And the fruit set time is critical because that's going to determine how many fruits you're going to eventually end up with. But it's also important because it's a cell division period, which is going to determine the eventual size of the fruit or the potential size of the fruit. If it's dry when the fruits are small and the cells are dividing, it's never going to get real large. Okay, so moving on to fertilizer. The bag's going to have three numbers on it. What in the world do those numbers mean? Well, it's always listed as a percent by weight of nitrogen phosphorus, and potassium. And even if it doesn't have one of those nutrients, it still will have the three numbers, uh, like the example there, 0520, doesn't have any nitrogen or potassium, but the numbers are still listed and you can see it has 52% phosphorus. So here's some examples you might run across, 888, 15525, 322, um, there is just about every possibility that you can uh, think of. And the example that I show here is 24, 6, 12. So it's 24% by weight of nitrogen, 6% phosphorus, and 12% potassium or potash. Then it also has those other numbers, um, which will be listed after the NPK. This one has 6% sulfur and 1% iron. And then it should tell you, or sometimes it will tell you, depending on the label, uh, what percentage of that is slowly available, slow release nitrogen. And in the, uh, where it says derived from, the next paragraph down, it says it contains 16% slowly available, slow release nitrogen. And then if it is organic, um, it's going to say so, and it needs to be certified organic or listed. Anyway, it could be organic. Uh, it could, could be conventional chemical fertilizer. It could say it's natural, which doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but here's an example of a citrus and avocado food, and I'm not promoting any, any particular brand. This is just one of the ones that's out there on the market. This one is 1064. You do want to have higher nitrogen than phosphorus or potassium. And ideally, you've gotten your soil test and you're following the recommendation for, uh, for your specific soil. But this bag is good because on the back, or this product on the back, it tells you the amount to use per tree based on the height of the tree, which of course, this is very generalized, but to give people something to go on the height of the tree, and also if it's a containers. And it is saying to start in February or March. Uh, February is good for us and go apply every six weeks, four, four times. If you want organic, oh, sorry, one more thing about this. It says with natural ingredients on the label, on the front of the label, it doesn't, it doesn't really, by law, that doesn't really mean anything. And it doesn't tell you 
even though it says it's fortified with essential plant minerals, none of those are listed. So I'm assuming that you can't count on what they are or the amount, they could vary. If you want an organic product, you need to look for the OMRI logo, uh, which you can see to the right side of this package. Um, this is OMRI, the Organic Materials Review Institute, which is an independent organization. And they review products that are looking to be labeled as organic. So if you're an organic grower or you want to be uh, you want to only use organic products, you need to, to look for that OMRI, OMRI listed logo. So they review it um, against the national organic standards, which are the law and which falls under USDA. And if they're found to be acceptable, they get the OMRI listing on the package. And also you can go to the OMRI.org website and find various products that, that provide various nutrients. A very informative uh, website. Okay, so again, as I mentioned, you want something higher in nitrogen than in phosphorus or potassium. Low release is ideal because it um, it doesn't leach into the groundwater as quickly, and it's available for a much longer time. And then again, here's some generalizations. If if the nitrogen level, so again, that's the first number, is less than 15 then apply a pound of that fertilizer per inch of trunk diameter per year, per year. So you're dividing that into multiple applications. The total is per year. And if the nitrogen percentage is above 20, then use uh, 0.75 pounds or less per inch of trunk diameter per year. Um, probably three to four applications is ideal in February, May, June and September, and you wanna spread it out uniformly under the tree, water it in thoroughly. It's always better to apply small amounts more frequently than to put on a whole lot at one time and or to use a slow release product. And organic products are generally gonna be slow release. Um, this relates to fruit drop. This is surprising, but only five to six of flowers that are produced actually develop into a harvestable fruit. Um, the tree puts on way more flowers than it can um, mature into fruit because there's so many different ways that they're lost. And these are the natural fruit drop periods. So 70 to 80% of the flowers might fall off um, just as a natural phenomenon. And then in April, there's gonna be another fruit drop uh, I mean, a fruit drop from pea to about marble sized fruits. Again, in May, late May, jawbreaker to golf sized fruits, even though it's June right now, that's, uh, that's what's dropping off my tree right now, my lemon tree. And then navel oranges will have another drop in mid to late summer. So don't be alarmed by this. Uh, this is just natural part of what a fruit tree, all fruit trees do. Okay, and citrus does have some issues. Um, a couple of insects, which I'll mention. Again, this is just sort of a quick overview, but these are the ones that are most common. The citrus leaf miner and the peel miner, but the leaf miner is much more common. Um, it, it's lar the larva of this insect gets in between the layers of the leaves and makes these little mines, you know, eats its way through. And this is extremely common on young foliage of all citrus plants. If the tree is mature, you don't really need to do anything to control it. Um, the tree can withstand it. But if the tree is a baby, you probably do need to do something to control it. Um, there are some natural predators, but you may have to use a, um, a chemical, uh, probably something that's systemic that can get inside the leaf. And then extremely common are some type of small sucking insect like aphids, white flies, scale, mealybugs that suck the juices out of the tree. And then they exude what we call honeydew, which is a sweet sticky substance. And it drops down on the leaves below it. And then 
<clears throat> the black sooty mold grows. Um, the sooty mold doesn't infect the leaf or the plant, but it it covers it so it can't photosynthesize. So it's a double whammy. The nutrients are getting sucked out and then it has trouble photosynthesizing. And then ants are the third party here and they come and they eat the honeydew. They want the honeydew. So they protect the sucking insects from predators that, that might come and attack them. So the easiest thing of the three to control is the sucking insect. White flies are difficult to control, but most of the others are fairly easy. You might be able to even just blast them off with a uh, water hose several, uh, several times or use insecticidal soap or neem oil or something like that. Anything with oil in it is also going to kill that sooty mold, which then will eventually will flake off or you can blast it off with the water hose again. And then the ant should go away because they don't have a reason to be on the tree if there's no honeydew for them to be eating. They are not going to feed on the tree itself. Hopefully you don't have uh, cut ants in your area, but if you do, you know, that's a, a separate issue. Um, and another thing you can do to control the so-called bad insects is to encourage the good insects. And these might be um, things that feed directly on the uh, the insect pests, or they might um, be parasites and lay their eggs in them. So here's just some of the examples. Um, spiders in general are good in the garden. They're usually there to eat bugs. Uh, this red wasp, uh, the first one on the left there, lays its eggs in uh, caterpillars. Here's a few more. Um, at the top there is a picture of an ant that is eating the honeydew from an, an aphid. Um, sometimes it's said that ants farm aphids or farm scale, and that's what they're talking about. Um, the natural enemies of aphids that are listed, the top pictures are the adults and the bottom pictures are the larvae. So you can see that they don't look much like they're adults. So it's good to, to be able to recognize these so that you're not trying to get rid of these good bugs. And then on the right is a parasitoid, which um, the top picture, the, this little teeny wasp is laying its egg in that creature. And then as its eggs hatch, they, they eat that creature from the inside. A good way to attract beneficials is to plant flowering plants such as uh, such as these that are pictured here. Any of the daisies, dill, yarrow, um, Queen Anne's lace, that family, uh, fleabane, Russian sage, pretty much any flowering plants. And then moving on to diseases, I'm just going to mention three here um, that are the most common or the most devastating and general management for diseases especially fungal diseases which do like to attack citrus are um, increasing the airflow around the plants which could be by cutting cutting back plants nearby or thinning out the citrus tree the center of the tree not getting water on the trunk as much as possible i mean don't specifically water the trunk uh, prune branches that are touching the ground because that is a way for insects and disease to uh, have easy access to the tree. So citrus screening is the first disease. Um, it is devastating. There is no cure for it and it kills trees. It affects the fruit quality so it's unmarketable. Um, it, is, it is a huge problem in citrus orchards. It's destroyed thousands of acres. Um, so again, it's called citrus greening and that greening part is referring to the, the fruit. The, the fruit doesn't, doesn't ripen, it stays green or doesn't color, it stays green. It's also known as um, Wang Long Bing or yellow dragon disease. Um, and it gets this real blotchy appearance to the leaves. So the tree would look kind of yellowish um, and the fruits stay green, but the, the yellowing, when you get close and look at the leaves, it's very, very blotchy. 
And here's some more pictures. Um, this, you can find a lot of information online about citrus greening. It's easy to find, but make sure you're going to a .edu or a uh, Department of Ag website, either state or USDA. Um, these are some of the symptoms again, the blotching and it is, and the fruit that's misshapen and not colored right. Um, it is spread by the um, Asian citrus psyllid, which is this little insect um, that just looks like things poking up on the leaf there. They feed at this angle. This is very uh, distinctive on them, of them. And they might be on the undersides of the leaves or the top of the leaves. And some of them are going to carry this bacterial disease, but not all of them are gonna have it. But if you see these psyllids on your tree, you should try to control them immediately. Um, and this is how tiny they are compared to a finger. So they're little teeny things. You gotta really look for them. But they, they spread the disease from plant to plant. Um, it has been confirmed in Texas since January of 2012 and has caused uh, a lot of havoc, especially in the valley, of course, where our commercial citrus orchards are. Again, there's no cure. Um, what we do is be vigilant looking for it and then destroy any trees that are, that are found with it. There is a quarantine because of citrus screening. And so you cannot move any plants from quarantine areas. Um, some states are quarantined, um, but in Texas, there's a number of areas that are quarantined. This is on the Texas Department of Ag website. Um, this, is, this is a law. Um, you cannot move plants and you can see the quarantine areas in the Gulf Coast. It's all of Brazoria, Fort Bend, Galveston, Harris, and Montgomery counties, um, as well as Aransas, Calhoun, Clayburg, and Oasis. So this is a serious problem um, that we really need to be on the lookout for. And again, there's no control, but you can, you can control those psyllids and also be on the lookout and report it to your agent or to uh, Department of Ag, if you even just suspect it, we would rather go out and check and find that it's not greening than to have a, have a plant go um, unreported because that's how it spreads. Okay, greasy spot. This is pretty common. It's these uh, spots that form on the leaves, especially on the undersides, but they eventually uh, develop onto the or spread so that they're visible on the top. And this could be what uh, one of the persons asking questions as. Um, fruit can drop prematurely. You get this, uh, this look on the, the rind, the dark spots, and the surrounding areas remain green. Uh, there are some fungicides that can be sprayed for this. And again, uh, practicing what I said about increasing, uh, increasing airflow and, and keeping the leaves and the trunk dry. And melanose is the last disease I was gonna talk about. It is like these raised dark spots on the leaves and the fruit. And if it gets worse, it can get this, uh, what's in the bottom picture there, the scabby looking stuff called mud cake. Um, leaves might drop prematurely with both of these. Um, and this is also called by, caused by a fungus. And again, there are fungicides that can be used to control this if it's extensive. If it's not extensive, you probably, on a mature tree, probably don't need to do anything except maybe increase the airflow and change some practices. Also, a tree that is lacking in nutrients is going to be a lot more susceptible to disease. So proper fertilization and proper watering will go a long way. And then I've just got a, a website I wanted to show you, um, aggie-horticulture.tamu.edu. Um, you can see there's all these different categories. This is a, a great website for Texas gardeners, and um, it's even got some for farmers. You can click on fruit and nut resources, 
and you'll uh, see all these different categories. Citrus is about halfway down on the left side. And there's also more citrus right hand column under other resources. So that concludes my presentation. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, there are a, a few questions. Um, I, I have a question that's asking about controlling leaf miners. They've been trying to do it organically, but they said they're not having any luck. And unfortunately, um, spray chemicals uh, aren't very effective for leaf miners because they're inside of the leaf. Do you have any other suggestions? Uh, Stephen has recommended spinosad. Yeah, I think spinosad would be the only organic one. Um, they can also take off those leaves um, because the larva is inside them. Take off and you know destroy those leaves. How far do I need to cut my citrus, my mandarin? How far do I need to make sure the airflow between the branches are? A space between the branches. Mm, well, there's. You want to cut at the center where there might be a lot of uh, a lot of shoots or branches that aren't going to produce anyway because they don't get sunlight. Um, just enough so that it's not real crowded. So maybe so you can see through the tree somewhat. Uh, but I don't have a a number of inches or anything. It just depends on the tree. So a lot on my tree. <laughs> possibly, possibly a lot, and you might want to do it say over two years if there is a whole lot. You know, cut okay. half of it this year and half of it next year. OK, great. Thank you. Just to thin it out some. OK, right, it's Ginger. really bushy. All right, Ginger, you have a couple of questions. One is about what causes their fruit to um, either be oversized or a little bit spongy. And then you have a question. Uh, I'll ask you the next question. After you. OK. Uh, the sponginess could be from too much nitrogen um, that can make the rot, the fruit spongy, or I guess the, I guess that's referring to the fruit, right? Not the rind. Yeah. Um, it could be too much nitrogen. So again, I would do a soil test. Um, citrus also needs some min minor nutrients from time to time, so I would look for a fertilizer that that has minor nutrients like iron, zinc and manganese especially, um, and then consistent watering on, you know, pretty much on a schedule. Okay, I get spongy fruit when I leave it on the tree too long, sometimes. Also. Oh yes, that that's another one. And then you have a question yes. about what is the best time of the year to prune branches? Uh, the best time to prune is is when the tree has just finished fruiting, when you've harvested all or most of the fruit. So it's going to vary with variety. All right. Uh, you have a question about espalier. Have you have you ever tried? Is uh, citrus suitable for making espalier? Yes, citrus is very suitable for espalier. Uh, it's it's done a lot with citrus. And you can find books or websites on how to do it. You can get a lot of uh, fruit in a much smaller area. And it looks cool. All right, you have a question uh, about typical age span of, of citrus trees. Oh, citrus can live a long time, like uh, 60, 100 years. How, if it's healthy. How, if they're healthy, how, we see lots of 25 or 30 year old trees in our in South in the South Texas area that uh, go into decline though. Yes, there are a lot of diseases that affect citrus and uh, a lot of ones that that'll actually kill it over time. Um, like like you're saying the decline where it's just a slow death kind of. It may be Phytophthora or it could even be a uh, a virus. So 20, 20 to 25 years is probably a lot more common, but they can live a very long time. 
Okay, and then uh, we have a question of, about uh, the environmental impact on fruit bearing. So how they want to know why one year you have a, a large crop of fruit and then the next year you might not have. Okay, yeah, it's very common. That's called alternate bearing. Uh, very common for a lot of fruits to have a big crop one year and then a small crop next year, big crop the next year. And it's just because it takes so much energy from the tree to produce that large crop that it, it doesn't have enough to produce a large crop the next year. It doesn't have enough reserves. So increasing the uh, fertilizer and watering might help, but it is a natural tendency. Um, you could thin out some fruit in a real heavy year if you wanted to um, get more consistent bearing. But it's natural for them to do that. I have a question about cut ants. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> If we if we do have a cut ant problem with our citrus, uh, which I do, uh, what do you do you suggest uh, taping the tree and putting some of that sticky stuff on it, or do you uh, is there something else? Yes, I think putting um, this is what I would recommend: putting some spun polyester type material around in a circle. I mean, circling the trunk and then some plastic wrap covering that and then painting the tangle foot, which is the product you're talking about that's very sticky over that. And this needs okay. to be like two, three inches wide, probably. Then the ants can't climb up the trunk. And you also have to keep keep an eye on it. It'll get dirt on it. It'll get you know a bunch of ant bodies and then they can climb over it. So you have to refresh it. But um, and then make sure there's no other way they can get onto the tree, like uh, from the front, an adjoining fence or tree or building. The, limp, the um, limbs type of yes. yes. And then other than that, there are some, some baits, like I think Grant's has been one that's been somewhat successful. Um, of course, the problem with controlling cut ants is they don't actually um, like other other ants will eat the bait and they will regurgitate it to their young to feed their young. I mean, they will regurgitate to feed the young and that's how the young get it. But uh, pet ants feed their their young a fungus that grows on the leaves that they have harvested off of your tree. Um, so the baits are only a little bit effective. Um, Maybe some boric acid, um, which is a powder. If they're walking through that, they will pick it up and they'll clean it off themselves and it'll reduce their number some, but cut ants are a definite challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Ginger. You're welcome. Kevin and Stephen, do you have any other questions? Hey, Ginger, this is Stephen. There was a question about coffee grounds, but I think we laid that one to rest. Um, it depends on what the question was. The um, question was, will coffee grounds help? It will not help uh, lower uh, soil pH, but it does add organic batter to the planting environment. That's about all it does. Mm -hmm. Maybe adds a little bit of nitrogen. Margaret wants to know, um, is there anything that you can do to enhance the flavor of your fruit? Oh, uh, just regular fertilizing and watering. That's really all you can do. Um, the thing that really makes citrus uh, fruit sweeter is a large variation in temperature from night to day, which so far I've had very little uh, success in controlling. <laughs> right. I don't actually don't see any other questions that haven't been addressed. So if there's anybody on there that has questions, ask them now. Before we go. And as a reminder, the link to this 
presentation will be emailed to you um, so you can refer to it. And those evaluations, if you would please fill out the evaluation, it's it's very short and uh, send them back. It would be very helpful to, to me and to us. We also need to remind everybody that this re is recorded just so that they know that, that um, their conversations and, and questions have been recorded as part of the recording, so. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you.